Exploring the Wonders of the Winter Sky, Part 2, with Michael Patrasco from Insight Observatory, our 2022 holiday special. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we're going to explore the winter skies using telescopes. But don't fret. We'll be talking with Michael Petrasco from Insight Observatory, learning how to see the winter sky using telescopes from the warmth and comfort of home. The winter sky is filled with dazzling targets calling out to amateur astronomers. Jupiter is shining brightly in the southwestern sky. You look for the king of the planets glowing with a bright white light in the southwestern skies during evening hours. Even a small telescope should reveal bands of color across the face of that mighty moon, that mighty world, as well as up to four of its moons. Go out over the course of several nights and you can actually see these Galilean moons of Jupiter race around their mighty parent world. Sky gazers in the Northern Hemisphere can witness the Andromeda Galaxy high in the Northwestern sky during evening hours. Located more than two and a half million light years from Earth, this is the most distant object which can be seen using just the human eye. This collection of hundreds of billions of stars is also an easy as well as rewarding target for those using binoculars or a backyard telescope. Look for this fuzzy patch of light in the sky more than 45 degrees to the, we to the west or the right of Jupiter. A fuzzy patch of light? Did I say fuzzy patch of light? Why indeed I did! And that brings us to M42, the Orion Nebula. Swing your view over to the southeast to find this constellation of Orion. The three stars which make up its belt are as an easy find in the night sky. From there, look a bit to the west or to the right and downward. This diffuse blob of light at the center of the Sword of Orion is a stellar nursery where new stars are being born. Large, bright, and stunningly beautiful. The Orion Nebula, or M42, is a favorite target for amateur astronomers around the globe. Probably the best known star in Orion, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, is a bright red star seen as the right shoulder of the celestial hunter. From this star, look up about 25 degrees and you'll find another bright red beacon in the sky. This is Mars. Turn a backyard telescope to this world and see if you can find the polar ice caps on our planetary neighbor. Before leaving this section of sky, turn your sights up and to the right again, about 20 degrees each way to find the Pleiades. Although known as the Seven Sisters, this cluster of stars nearly 450 light years from Earth has around 100 members. Even a small telescope will reveal the Pleiades in stunning detail. If you don't have a telescope or even a good pair of binoculars, there's no reason to fret. Online observatories such as InSight Observatory or Telescope Live uh, allow the public to use telescopes from the comfort of their own homes. Next up, we welcome Michael Petrasco from InSight Observatory to the show. He's going to tell us all about what we can see in the night sky this winter with a telescope, even if you don't own a telescope. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you.
This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Michael Petrasco. He is managing member and project developer at Insight Observatory, and he offers access to some pretty cool telescopes right from your own home. Welcome to the show, Michael. Oh, thank you, James. It's very good to be here. Thanks for having me. Ah, anytime, anytime. So can you just tell us a little bit about Insight Observatory and what is it that you folks are doing out there? Well, basically, it started with a friend of mine and I who grew up fostering each other's interest in amateur astronomy. And he was living out in Arizona, and he purchased a dream astrograph, the 16-inch F3.75, mm. when it was a sort of like a prototype in, in back in the day. And then um, he was uh, transferred out to uh, Poland for work. And then when it was ready for delivery, we really didn't have a place to put it. And I mm. live in New England, so the skies aren't that great here. And then in Poland, the skies aren't that great as well. It's sort of like New England weather where he is out there. So we came up with the concept about um, 10 years ago, like maybe we should host it somewhere remotely and then mm. we can use it that way. Uh, he can use it from Poland. I can use it from New England. And then as we were doing a search for hosting facilities, we came up with the idea of like, wouldn't it be great to share it with the education community? Mm. Like allow students or, you know, college researchers working on thesis or you know, any type of research project to be able to access it as well and use it. So that's how the whole name Insight Observatory came about because we were get, going to be, our mission was to give insight to the universe, to classrooms around the world. And that's what our slogan is, is bringing the universe to homes and classrooms around the world. Wow. Wow. That's, that's so cool. So what are, what are some of the advantages of uh, using remote telescopes, especially for people who are just getting into amateur astronomy? Well, one of the major things is the cost. So they don't have to go out there and purchase all this high-end equipment for a lot of money. We, we put it out there. We started with one telescope that we owned and we figured, okay, we have it. Why don't we make it affordable for those who can't access something like this or, or mm. can't buy something or purchase it. So that's when the whole education thing came about and we created an application for classroom use. So the classrooms could use their Chromebooks or iPads or, or even their personal phone devices to access our application to actually request image data. And we work with the teachers in the classroom. So that was one of the, the main focuses. And we also have, uh, standard clients that are not in the education field that use our telescopes because the same thing it's cost or the location they're in is bad weather bad climate so that that's how i look at the advantage of remote telescope right all right and i'd just like to add you know as you know i was an amateur i've been an amateur astronomer all my life and you know my dad and i had an old c8 orange tube scope that we'd bring out every weekend that wasn't cloudy in New England. And my dad was a mechanical genius. I am not. So although I love astronomy, you know, sometimes getting, you know, the telescope set up and, you know, lined up with the North Star and the equatorial mounts and all this stuff can be quite a hassle. I just find remote telescopes are just Fabulous, allowing you to just really concentrate on the science and on the photo and not on not on mechanics. Yes, and then there's um argument out there about, you know, are you taking are you really taking this astro photo if it's all set up in a line for you and the camera is all set up? And then there's those, you know, who are setting everything like you mentioned from you know, from the beginning, alignment. Um, make sure tracking's all set and, you know, hats off to them. They do an amazing job because that's a lot of work to put right. into an astro photo. Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, th that's part of the advantage too. Like you said, is it's already set up to go and um, you put your image request in and then they um, get executed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just it's fabulous. Um, so what are some of the objects that people might be able to see? And then, you know, over December, January, that the most popular books. objects that are imaged um, on our 16 inch are it's usually M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. That's a popular one. 
M42, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Great Orion Nebula, uh, uh, IC434, the Horsehead Nebula, that people love imaging that because, you know, that's a great uh, nebula to image. So there's a lot of gems out there in the winter sky, late fall that are, you know, perfect for our telescope. Hmm. And it seems that, um, to me anyway, that astronomy is almost a universal love among people, you know? I mean, hats off and kudos to, you know, the biologists and the geologists out there and, you know? But what is it? But there's something that just makes the general public love astronomy in a way they don't take to other sciences why is that that that's a good question um i have found you know by doing inside observatory and developing this whole project over the last couple of years is i've met so many people around the world that have been interested in working with us and also working with them and you're right everybody is just intrigued by it and then when i go into a, a classroom you know in a school they're they love doing the project. The teachers come back to us year after year because their students enjoyed imaging the cosmos so much through our telescope network. So yeah, that's a good question. There's something about, you know, magical about the cosmos that brings us all together. Hmm. Hmm. And so what do you find are people's biggest, well, first of all, if somebody wants to get into remote imaging um, using insight or another observatory what, what would you where do they start what what would be the first steps for them uh we have um a, an application which is called a personal image request and uh that we has a website you go there and you basically it explains how to take your first image um and it's just a simple uh 20 minute exposure um in luminance, red, green, and blue, each five minutes. And uh, we have the telescopes that are listed in there just have, uh, they're, they're fast telescopes. So you will we'll get some good results for a short exposure like that. Um, so we push that out. We recommend people go there to try it out. Um, and we also uh, work with other people through our, um, we have an advanced imaging request and a basic image request on our, what we call the ATEO portal. The ATEO portal, ATEO is an acronym for Astronomical Telescopes for Educational Outreach, because mm -hmm. that's what we designate some of our telescopes that we operate, because that's what the whole mission <coughs> is. And, uh, but you can go through that portal, we have an advanced image request application and a basic. So the advanced one is where you can put more, it's for the more experienced astrophotographers to put their, parameters in for imaging. And the basic is a little like the personal image request application that I just told you for beginners, like it's like a primer. The basic image request has more options, but it's very similar to the personal image request. Hmm. And so what sort of skills would someone want to have if they're going to undertake this journey? Well, that's the whole thing about astrophotography is it's a learning curve. Um, there are many tutorials out there on YouTube that are fantastic, put out by experienced astrophotographers. So what we'll do is um, uh, we'll recommend if they're just beginning, they can get the data from us. And then we recommend certain websites for tutorials to learn how to use it, because there's many free ones out there that can be used. And what do you think are the biggest challenges for someone starting on astrophotography? Oh. The biggest challenge, um, probably learning the the whole stacking process, mm -hmm. trying to figure like, how do I make this color image from a clear luminance, red, blue, and green uh, frame, you know, image? How do I make a color out of those individual ones? That's been the question we've had the most. Right. So are you working with, are you just using third party sources and saying, here are your, you know, here are some good places to look to learn how to deal with these, what, what are called FITS files? Yes, correct. Stacking, or are you going to be developing any of your own learning systems or? Uh, in time. Um, yeah, right now we've just been establishing our telescope network and the application portal. 
Uh, but we have a lot of uh, associates. We have some expert, really good imaging processors on our team that really make our data look good because <laughs> they're <laughs> very good. I, myself, I'm so so. So, um, but there's we have uh, three three of us, three people on our are that are in our organization that are really good, and they also they put tutorials out. So we actually will give the links to the the tutorials to the people to learn how to do this. That is so fabulous. And so what is the future of remote telescopes? What's, what's happening in the technology? Well, the equipment is getting very advanced. Um, and like the one shot color cameras, you know, years ago, just a few years ago, you know, they're grainy or, you know, very noisy, you know, mm -hmm. but they're even those today are getting, you know, putting out superb images. So it's accelerating. Um, and I and I think as the years go by, I think it's going to be more accessible for people. We're trying, like our goal is to make our portal as user friendly as possible, um, so they're not confused and turned off, and then just want to go away because it's too confusing. But we have a we make sure that if they're signing up, we're, we make sure that they're you know are happy with the usage of it. And if there's any concerns to contact us, we, we pride ourselves on being in touch with our users on a regular basis. That's great. And I've always really enjoyed working with you folks. You've always been. Well, thank you. You've all, all of you have been wonderful. So, and finally, what is next for Inside Observatory? What are you guys doing? What are you up to? Yeah, so we have our advanced image request application basic advanced, as I mentioned on the portal. But uh, one of the products we have, we, we call Starbase. And basically it's an um, image set repository uh, for images. So if you don't wanna take the time to put an image request and, and wait for images to come back from a telescope, we have image sets that are, have already been imaged and in, in there for people to subscribe to and download. And uh, it's similar to like um, Telescope Live. Telescope Live has a wonderful product mm -hmm. for d downloading data. It's fantastic for uh, for image processing. Uh, the, the angle that we come at with Starbase is that we allow amateur astronomers out there with high-end equipment that want to maybe get a return on their investment. They can upload their data. Huh. And at the same time, you know, we split profit, uh, the actual sales, um, the income with them. And so they can get some a return on their investment. At the same time, they're providing income for us to keep our telescopes operating for our education mission. That's fabulous. You folks are doing great work. Thank you for everything you're doing. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah. And that was Michael Petrasco, managing member and project developer at Inside Observatory. Now, uh, you early birds out there are going to get to see your own set of treats in the morning sky. Go out around 5 a.m. and look for a bright bluish white star low on the northeastern horizon. This is Vega. Now, that sounds familiar. This was a star which appeared to be the source of the alien radio signaling contact. I'll just wait here while you go rewatch that movie. Okay, from Vega, head on up and to the right again. Between 15 and 20 degrees each way is going to bring you to the great star cluster in Hercules. Now, if you have trouble finding it, look further up above the eastern horizon for a stunningly bright red star. This is Arcturus. Now, if you trace a line from this star back to Vega, the cluster is found about 60% of the way back to Vega and a little bit up. Now, this collection of hundreds of thousands of stars is considered by many to be the finest globular cluster seen from northern skies, and it is well worth the search. Now, finish out your morning exploration with a tour of the western skies. 
dozens of bright nebulae and star clusters are hiding just above and to both sides of the rutted giant Betelgeuse. A good pair of astronomical binoculars will reveal the secrets hidden in this large patch of space. Enjoy your explorations. And the Cosmic Companion is going to take next week off for the holidays. Yay! But we return on the 31st of December. Yay! New Year's Eve for our season finale, Space 2023. I'm going to tell you what's happening in the cosmos over the coming next year. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download, share, comment, boost, do whatever you do to need to do to get this show out to the universe. Drop the show into a friend's DMs. Listen, I'm counting on y'all to make this happen, okay? So, what's that? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll wait while you share this. All right, welcome back. Visit uh, CosmicCompanion.com and sign up for our newsletter. Each episode will appear in your email inbox. Face it, it's probably more interesting than most of the stuff you have in there. Huh. Y- you know I'm right. Clear skies. <laughs>